Welcome to The Label Podcast, a show about disability, illness and difference. I'm Lucy. And I'm Alice. And that's Hi guys! Don't forget in this episode, I might swear, Lucy might cry, and you can check out details of the trigger warnings on our website. A trigger warning for this episode, we will be discussing conversion therapy. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Label Podcast. This is another episode in our Autism Awareness Week series. Uh, I think this is going to be the last one we put out, so I hope you guys have enjoyed it. This one should be I think really interesting. We've got uh, Lydia Wilkins with us today. Uh, Lydia, do you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Hi, obviously you all know my name is Lydia. Um, So I work as a freelance journalist slash newsletter editor. Whenever people ask me to introduce myself, I'm never really sure what to say. Um, (laughs) It's kind of across the intersection between lifestyle and disability. Um, a lot of that has primarily come out of the fact that I'm on the autistic spectrum. I wouldn't be talking to you today if that wasn't the case. I was also previously on the Journalism Diversity Fund for my NCTJ and right now I'm writing a book, apparently. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> I like that you don't seem certain about the book writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's my first book. It's my first book. But the thing is about this, I hadn't, because I don't really have a lot of familiarity with writing a book. I'd so, sort of had interviewed authors and kind of worked alongside them for a long time. But I didn't really know about the kind of ins and outs and the physicality of, okay, sit down, here's a thousand words today, and that sort of thing. And, and then the amount of research and having to, like, you know, make sure that you've got all the copyright permissions and, like, yeah. you're not quoting or stealing work and all that sort of thing it was really quite daunting, to be honest. Mm. Um, so I have started, in case my publisher's listening to this, <laughs> <laughs> I had... I have started, but it's really slow and really quite laborious. You're allowed to tell us what it's about. Yeah, I hope so. No one's told me otherwise, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is, I am writing. It's called the Autism Friendly Cookbook. Um, this started, it's funny because when people ask me this, I try not to go on a lot. Um, but it's, it's sort of funny to me how things come full circle sometimes. So I had been going for personal independence payment between the first and second lockdown. This left me having to go to a tribunal, which at the time of speaking to you both hasn't gone ahead, but it was largely because when autistic females are sort of put under kind of like an assessment lens, there is a lot of bias and a lot of stereotypes. So we are typically not diagnosed until quite later on in life for example. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, So, for example, the report said, I apparently have no challenges when it comes to communication. ASD is is probably literally the definition of that. (laughs) But so, and, and it was kind of just sort of really sort of basic things like that. And it was saying how it was to the point where it was so utterly exaggerated that it was that I like to joke and say they almost thought that I was sort of like a chef who could conjure up a roast dinner within like half an hour, like it was that stupid. And right. one over the course of about three days, I was talking to my mum about this, being developmentally delayed means that you will always have a skills attainment gap between you and what is considered quite unquote normal. Yeah. I can I cannot just learn. It takes me a hell of a long time to be able to have anything that's even standard. So telling me that I'm going to have to learn this, but not be supported while doing so is, was really quite striking. Mm. At, I never really learnt to cook, and that was primarily to do with things to do in education and the fact that I was sort of 
when I got to secondary school, it was sort of really obvious that I was manifesting my difficulties. I just didn't have the label. Mm. That was it wasn't particularly received quite well and trying to learn to cook did not work at all in the mainstream environment. I didn't really learn and I'm sort of catching up now. But it is amazing to me that that sort of standard. There are so many people who are on the spectrum I've also been talking to who are like, oh, I just like, you know, get something up the packet or I like, buy a mm. lot of pre-prepared food or I don't know how to cook, so I just rely on people who care for me sort of thing. Mm. But there's this weird expectation that my community, if you like, I don't really like the word community, but I'll use it for the sake of argument. My community seem to have this expectation on them to just let other people care for them. Whereas I quite like to think everyone who has a disability, chronic illness or difference, as is the tagline for this podcast, um, that they should be given the chance at independence if they are able to. Very on brand, Lydia. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Completely doing your research there, Lydia. <laughs> After just betraying my very journalistic sensibilities. <laughs> um, but just, it, it was just really striking. And it even said in my personal independence assessment that my because my mum cares for me, that my mum should be able to continue supporting me. But that's that's unfair because what if she wanted to go away for a weekend or like an extended period of time or it's called personal independence payment so yeah. the suggestion is that the payment is there to promote your independence going oh well her mum can look after her is not and it's for this reason exactly why the dwp is going in the book acknowledgements <laughs> 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 and over the course of about three days within my very sort of my brain was sort of working overtime and it was kind of like okay why why is there not a place where all the sort of relevant information is so mm. why is there i used to work as a webinar person for a project that promoted asd and kind of positive strategies for coping and living life and it was really interesting how many parents would come up to me because this was on Zoom because, you know, pandemic. Uh, um, they would contact me. They would contact me afterwards and they would say, oh, my God, what, how did I not know this sort of information about very sort of basic things? So if your child doesn't like a particular form of, say, fruit or veg, why not put it in another form? So instead of biting an apple, for example, why not cut it up? You could puree it, you could make it into juice and they would still be having the same thing effectively. They'd still be eating. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so over the course of about three days, I had sort of drafted up kind of like a structure almost of things I would cover and the recipes and kind of like how to make it accessible. I contacted Jessica Kingsley Publishers. They have a really accessible form on their website they ask questions instead of you having to put it all in one word document yeah. as some publishers do um and over at christmas they wrote back to say yeah we're really interested we're having a meeting to if the kind of the wider department wants to have a buy-in i'm told it's called that in i think it was the second of january they were like oh here's your here's your offer and it was like oh my god whoops but okay <laughs> I, didn't do really, it now. I didn't really expect them to say yes because it was just sort of one of those mad ideas that i just sort of plucked out of the madness that was yeah. happening um i mean lydia that's what this entire podcast is so i wouldn't yeah. worry too much about it <laughs> you'll work it out as you go along <laughs> lydia do you like cooking then is it is cooking something that interests you or no Oh, <laughs> it's, it's, I'm a terrible cook. I mean, it's, it's, I've learned kind of sort of, I have set recipes. Right. So I, I am proficient at making things like sponge cakes and macaroni cheese, for example. But that's the only best because of all the foods. I, <laughs> that's only because I've sort of done it over and over and over again. So I've sort of learned how to make it better each time sort of thing. Yeah. It's. 
it was more sort of a kind of like a raging at this injustice sort of thing <laughs> but I, I have this idea off the back of it but when it comes to recipe books as well they're really inaccessible mm. so the idea was i don't know if you've come across it the spoons method where you measure energy i yeah. have heard of the spoons yeah um so i kind of let's say i repurposed it i had my own sort of spoon metric system for tracking my own energy levels yeah um so the idea was each recipe will have a metric for your energy level so that can help things such as planning and executive dysfunction all that sort of thing it would be catalogued by the social occasion so if you had like say you had like friends coming around but you'd had a meltdown earlier that day and you're just kind of like so depleted i don't want to do anything and i just sort of want to hide you would still be able to make the food that's a great uh, it's such a great idea when you first mentioned it i immediately thought of the anarchist cookbook which is all about you know how to make bombs and dynamite so <laughs> i think yours sounds much <laughs> much more useful to society it just <laughs> more maybe more friendly and just in general i don't know yeah. um, it's, it's not it's not explosive i promise let's just it was really, it was just sort of really striking to me because there are often times people on the spectrum have come up to me and said uh if i've not got the energy to do this yeah. even though that i know that i'm hungry they would say they wouldn't bother eating because it's just too much they yeah it seems to me that there was a problem and that there wasn't but it was almost like not being given the tools that you needed and added with the expectation that you would just live at home for the rest of your life like no um <laughs> and i think it it also says a lot that it it goes into the assumption everybody always makes about you know well autism is a problem with uh kind of communication and so therefore why would you ever have any problems with cooking you don't need to talk to your food but it's <laughs> it just goes to show that disabilities and chronic illnesses and cognitive impairments impact people in such far-reaching ways that the yeah. wider community don't ever consider it's funny you say that i had to a little while ago i was writing a piece about kind of the process to having a diagnosis almost due to i was two months shy of turning 16 when i had the final appointment in the whole civil saga and the idea was uh we just need to give her like the label as it were yeah. to so that she can have the adaptations for her gcse's yeah well that was all fine and good but that was more the sort of why rather than the how yeah. so it's scientifically there was an explanation for what was effectively turned my weirdness why i was like i was um but then when it came to things like why i'm people would say that i seem really disorganized i'm really untidy just because i find it impossible i came to there's a charity in brighton that supports me and it was the first time in my life really that i'd had any meaningful support and where it wasn't patronizing or trying to get me to do something that i wasn't able to do frankly and they offer courses and during the course of these courses that was a mouthful to say they were <laughs> they were sort of telling me kind of like oh yeah so you might have an issue with interception for example which is kind of how you interpret senses you might not necessarily be able to tell if it's hot or cold particularly well or if it's if you're hungry for example and what and I, when i was telling my mum this she, her jaw just sort of dropped really because she was like oh my god that explains why you were like you were when you were a child for example mm. i was the kid who would i apparently one year i ran around in leggings in snow and couldn't tell it was cold for example mm. that sounds really horrible and like really embarrassing to say out loud but yeah it's just nobody sort of told me the kind of like how it impacts you it was kind of more just like oh here's a label bye mm. like i wasn't offered no support after that whatsoever so so lydia when you got your label it wasn't a case of oh that's a relief it was more of a 
well, what do I, what do I do now kind of thing? And, you know, having to find that support it, when you got the support in place that you actually felt like now I understand it. Now I understand why I like, why I was like how I was. Yeah. Um, it happened that there's a funny thing, I think, where at the time I was at, so at the time I was diagnosed, the new diagnostic criteria had sort of come in. So on my diagnostic form, it actually has Asperger syndrome, but it has because it was felt I didn't tick the right box on it. So I kind of both terms on it. So I'm, I'm still autistic, but yeah. But the thing yeah. about this was, it was the te- because of the terminology, it's I've always been described as, for example, quirky by teachers. It didn't, it took me years to realise that under the Equality Act, that ASD is actually considered a disability, which was, oh, okay. And I spent maybe a year and a half trying to sort of reconcile this because I was like, because I was very aware that I am capable of some things, but sort of not really acknowledging to myself that there were some things that I'm really not capable of. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's something we've talked about with previous guests is that that word disability and people considering themselves disabled or differently abled or able bodied or however you want to sort of term the different almost stages of it. And for me, it kind of comes down to if you look at that word disabled, you know, really it means not able. And so if you have a health condition that means you're not able to do something, whatever it is, if you have a health condition that negatively impacts certain elements of your life, whether that's because of your physicality or, you know, just the social structure of the community you live in, then I I would like it if people kind of took that, that word disabled as a positive thing, as if to say, well, I've I have a health condition that means that for some reason I find X or Y difficult. And because of that, I'm entitled to certain support because of that. You need to be aware of, you know, things that I might need. You need to support me differently and make things accessible for me. It's that thing about the society being accepting and not, not thinking that it's like a them and us mentality, but just being accepting of, Okay, so that's Lydia. She's got autism. But but that is an ideal world, isn't it? Where I think it's like sometimes a bit like a a, a fairy tale land where you think, wouldn't it be nice if everybody just went, oh, yeah, that's Lucy. She's in a wheelchair. That's Alice. She's blind. And that's Lydia who has autism. It's never going to, you know, be like that, unfortunately. I had a conversation with my husband yesterday or the other day, and we talked about how there are a lot of people in the cis community who have trouble with um, trans rights and particularly when it comes to toilets and things like that. Yeah. And we basically were talking about it and I just went, I just don't care. I absolutely no. do not care what is in somebody else's pants. Why does it have any impact on me whatsoever? No. It's a whole issue as well of people, be, I, I don't want to share a toilet with with that and you know as horrible as it may sound that is the kind of mentality we're looking at Mm. but can i just reframe that and say you don't like sharing a toilet with that well as a a disabled person we often have to share the toilet with outdoor furniture and you know people (laughs) coat and spare chairs and stuff and you just 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 think about it will you before you start kicking up a force because we don't kick up a force it's interesting you mentioned disabled toilets because then the thing is that so I tend not to use them and this was I had quite a horrible experience I was at the Royal Albert Hall a few years ago and this was I think I'd been diagnosed for maybe a year a year and a half mm-hmm. and I I forget the circumstance but I was having frankly quite a spectacular meltdown and I was finding it really quite difficult being in this quite overwhelming environment Mm. and my mum was sort of like okay here's the disabled loop like go in there like sort yourself out because when you have a meltdown people sometimes forget that it has kind of like a knock-on effect so I quite struggle with I struggle with things kind of that are sort of motor skills based 
after the meltdown, for example, like my hands don't particularly work very well. My spatial awareness goes really quite badly wrong. So I'd be, it's not great particularly, but sometimes afterwards mm-hmm. I'd be like walking into walls and doors and things and it's, everything sounds amplified. And I'll never forget, I came out and I felt really quite bad because I could hear there was a woman outside who was being quite confrontational to my mum. And she, so she was a wheelchair user, but she thought I was abusing the toilet system. Yeah. Yeah, and I felt really quite terrible about that because she was waiting there and she was going, well, as long as she's disabled, she's allowed to use it, but I don't think she is. And all that sort of thing. And but it's the phrase, I don't think she is, is just, you know. And in that situation, the thing that I just think is, well, then the place should accommodate for more than one disabled person needing to use the toilet at any yeah. one time. Completely. Basically, yeah. you know, regardless of whether you think somebody has a disability or not, you should work under the assumption that there are, the, it's not just the, they don't just let one disabled person out a day <laughs> we have a we have a special pass that we all share <laughs> is it your turn out to dallas <laughs> <laughs> so a tweet recently where there was someone who suggested that um disabled parking bays should have i think it was a time limit so there should oh, only be yeah. you, you know the one i mean don't you and somebody would reply going we're not we're werewolves. On. We're not werewolves. <laughs> we don't, we're not coming out when there's a full moon. It's just it's the thing about disabled access. I often find it easier because of the, because of the it's spaced better. Yeah, and I don't have to kind of it's it's a spatial awareness thing. So I'm not going to bash myself. I'm not going to potentially uh, cover mm. myself in bruises. I find it easier in terms of like even forgive me for being crass handling things. So like you know soap and that sort of thing but with the after this we had like the sunflower lanyard and that sort of thing and that's been really useful because i've had i've not had to explain really i've not had to justify myself and i've had it's amazing because i have so much more help rather than just going oh she's an able-bodied person yeah it's i don't want to yeah that was my experience before i got my guide dog um because you know i have got a reasonable amount of sight and and so until you know i got and i never i never ever used an orientation cane i hated hated a white cane and so it suddenly you know i started walking around with the dog and it's like people throw themselves at you be like oh what can i do to help (laughs) whereas before if i tripped over in the street like people just be like well what's wrong with her and i think doesn't that say a lot about society if you see someone trip in the street and you just go, oh, God, what's wrong with her? And then you see a guide dog user walk past you minding their own business. You feel suddenly compelled to ask them if they need help. Yeah, that is it's I never really understood this because it's uh, sometimes when I go around, I try and sort of decode the social expectation and kind of that thing. But I've never really understood why people don't stop to help. Like what? What? What is the rule here? But I'd just be sort of like, oh, okay, somebody's fallen over, hurt themselves. Do I need to call like an ambulance or that sort of thing? Mm, yeah. But and pe- it's I've been told by people who I know are not on the spectrum, and they're just like it's not our business. Even if you look at people with tattoos, for instance. So I can remember watching a program. This woman is, she was covered from head to toe in tattoos, quite quite striking tattoos, not just like little ones, like big everywhere and they did an they did um an experiment where she covered her tattoos in makeup and then went on the street and asked people could you help me please i'm looking for you know can you ask me where you know where's the directions to the shop for instance she did exactly the same thing but took the makeup off so her tattoos were on show and nobody i think there was like, like two people stopped to help her but everybody else was like oh no i'm not no i don't want to help you and that's because she's got tattoos. I mean, if if society is frightened of tattoos, then we've got no hope, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Especially those of us who are disabled and have tattoos. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I feel like I feel like we should even sort of have like merchandise for your podcast at the back of this. Have like <laughs> scary and tattooed. <laughs> sort of thing. Just like, yeah. like with a badge or like a t shirt sort of thing. So you wanted to, one of the reasons we invited you on, Lydia, was because we wanted to talk to people with autism um, about sort of specific 
elements of their experience of autism, but also, uh, you know, kind of the issues that are important to them and the things that they kind of want people to to be aware of. And we've had some uh, interesting stuff over the week. We had uh, we've had people talking about gender and again the the disparity in um, diagnoses for women with autism we've had some people uh come on talking about the, that kind of sensory impact of autism which you've also touched on and i believe that there was a couple of things that you wanted to talk to us and sort of tell us about so at the time of recording there is a lot of controversy over the film music that sia has released that was really striking about the sia film um there is how to phrase this the thing about representation was really interesting because she said oh she had tried to cast an autistic actor but the thing is it's kind of also a grassroots problem so back in december i had been writing a piece about his dark materials which is my special interest because it it struck me how they had some they had sort of done diversity in the proper way so to speak they had spanish people they had English people, they had Americans, Scottish, they had people who had disability, they had different ethnic makeup, they had pretty much everything that you could expect, but they hadn't sort of done it in a way that was tokenistic. Yeah. It wasn't story specific either, was it? That was one of the things that I always think about representation is, you know, you see films about disabled people with disabled people in them, and it's like you never see a film where there's a disabled person and they're, they're in a rom-com or something like that you know so that was something that i i felt about the the his dark materials show is that they're diverse without kind of going hey look at how diverse we are it's also noticeable in the books how there isn't i don't know if it was deliberate but this is a question i would kind of like to put to philip borman it's interesting to me that there isn't sort of reference to kind of physical characteristics in that respect so I remember seeing a tweet, for example, saying how the character of Will Parry, how that the show was apparently being, what's the word, not racist, um, oh, like ableist. A, ableist? No, no, it's that no. kind of opposite of racist, isn't it? Like overly PC. Yeah, but yeah. In, yeah. In the in the books, they there is no reference to the ethnic makeup of Will Parry. I don't think so. What well, what was the what was the problem? They had an amazing actor. I remember when the Harry Potter stage. So when the I read the Harry Potter books when I was twelve or whatever, and then the first Harry Potter book went came a uh, film came out, and I went, "What are you doing? Hermione's black." Because in my head, Hermione had always been black. I don't know why. It was just something about the way I read the character. She never said Hermione's a white girl. Yeah. yeah. But she also never said it the other way. She never said Hermione's white or black. She just described Hermione. And then they cast the lady whose name I can't remember in the stage show. And it was it was almost as if I felt like... Because I also know that the reason they cast... Um, oh, what's her name? Emma... Watson. Watson, Watson thank you. Uh, the reason they picked Emma Watson to play Hermione was because J.K. Rowling said she reminded her of herself as a child and i was like precociousness i don't know i was like that's not (laughs) but that's not that's not what you should be casting you should be casting for hermione yeah yeah it was just sort of really interesting that they had an amazing actor to play will parry but the he just sort of brought it to life for me and i couldn't quite understand what why people had an issue with this in the course of writing the piece i was writing there was a kind of Twitter backlash. Um, there was a casting agency who I will send an image after this because it won't make a lot of sense otherwise. They put a call out for a particular person that they wanted to cast, and they'd had this thing where they said, in taking into account that they had responsibilities under the Equality Act, that they effectively didn't want somebody who was disabled to apply. I saw, I read that, yeah, and it was. They, everybody was outraged, quite rightly, um, and it was a, a disability opt-in thing that campaigning mm. for. You know, put the put the box, tick the box that says disability. You know, disability 
applicants are welcome to apply kind of thing disabled not disability yeah and it, it just sort of it was really striking because it said in the description of the character how they wanted someone who was kind of fun loving and outgoing i think the words were but when it comes to films like music produced by sia that it always struck me as being sort of nepotistic because they she had worked with the lead character oh yeah yeah she was never gonna cast anybody else i don't i i almost don't know why there's a discussion because they were never gonna cast anybody other than her i think there were also screenshots that were i may be wrong about this so i'm putting alleged i'm put allegedly there is screenshots of the movie i've not seen it i won't watch it you know, I just think it's out. Her attitude, her ableism is just disgusting, and I won't watch it. However, I have seen the screenshots of the film, and even as somebody who has not got autism, it makes my toes curl. It really does. It makes me feel sick to my stomach because it is a caricature of, you know, the way autistic people cope with, you know, things around them. It's a caricature of it. So the, the, the teeth on show and that kind of thing and the, the way they blink and it's just awful, awful. There were screenshots that were circulating suggesting that Sia never intended to cast an autistic actor. It was always mm. going to be, is it Maddie Zilger? Zilger? I'm not sure how you pronounce Something, her name. Yeah. Yeah. So it just sort of, I think it's also kind of a grassroots issue, but from the bottom up to when you get the produced product of a film that there needs to be access isn't quite the right right word for this but there needs to be consideration every step of the way and giving equal choice in that respect it's yeah. the, mm. it's the screenshots as you say did make me wince i find it interesting as well that the apparently the character is supposed to be biracial right. okay right so but but mm, do we think it's really appropriate that the casting? Where where's the, the the script and the story for this film come from? I don't. Like, is it based on a book? Is it based on a screenplay somebody else wrote? Is it something that Sia pitched up and you know was like, I want to do this? My understanding is that she sort of wrote an album of music, but sort of put the film alongside, if that makes sense, because the music is her sort of thing yeah it fits in yeah. with the thing i'm just lost for words with it really he compares Thea's attitude to anne hathaway who when she was in the witches with the disfigured hands and everything and when she realized she was horrified and made an apology and said you know i'll never let it happen again and then you compare Thea's attitude to when she was given the same sort of criticism it was you know to towards actors with autism you know i've been working all these years to try and get a job like this and somebody able-bodied with no background in autism has got the role and she just turned around and said well maybe you're a bad actor it's just that's not the point is it it's also the thing so the character i'm told is supposed to also be epileptic which is quite common when you are also in the autistic spectrum okay right so isn't it interesting how, despite this, there are apparently several dance numbers that have lighting that is challenging. I'm going to use the word challenging. Apologies if anyone listening is offended. Challenging to people who are epileptic that it would potentially trigger a seizure. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you can't you can't see it, but I'm just shocked and shaking my head because it's just. <laughs> Oh. And it's a real shame because I quite liked Sia's music before all this hoo-ha. I was a big fan of her music, her, yeah. some of her early stuff, and quite a lot of her more upbeat stuff is on like my workout album. And um, I'm going to have to take it all off when I finally get off my backside <laughs> and start working out again. <laughs> it is just so damaging. So damaging. The thing is, as well, there's sort of a little while ago, I was writing about the appearance of Greta Thunberg in Britbox for the mm -hmm. Metro because I had taken over Samantha Rank's column while she was away. Because that the puppet to me was not, it was not particularly tasteful or very sort of the even just the way that the puppet was moving, for example, was sort of it was taken like it felt a little bit too close to the bone to me 
Yeah, uh, like it. It's I know people who also have dyspraxia, for example, who are also autistic. Yeah, and that they were making the, these kind of weird, jaggedy sort of looking movements and kind of playing into stereotypes that Greta Thunberg is in fact a quote doomsayer. It was just not really on and there were people who the comment section was vile um but the thing about this was people were kind of suggesting to me that i should go away and write my own version to get representation right if you have such an issue because you're a writer you're in the metro this piece is going to follow me to the grave i've had me <laughs> um it's just it shouldn't it should not be incumbent on people such as myself do you have to kind of answer to the problem almost no it shouldn't be up to the peers like people with disabilities to retrain us but like movie producers and tv producers and go actually now i know what i'm doing give me the camera and i'll create something and show you how it's done properly that is ridiculous well and it's not like disabled people have just suddenly appeared like if we were a new species and yeah. there was only three of us and nobody else in the world knew how to represent us or how to write us and talk about us then fine maybe we should go and do mm -hmm. but there are millions of us and there are writers and producers and stuff in the world who, you know, write aliens and, <laughs> and fantasy stories. You can't stretch your imagination to think about what it might be like for a person with autism when you can actually interview people with <laughs> autism yeah. and ask well, them. And they're quite willing to go, I'll tell you yeah. about my experiences. Yeah. Yeah. If, any, if we've learned anything doing this podcast is that people are quite willing to come on and just talk to us for an hour. <laughs> it's I sort of on reading this, but sometimes I have people who I know contact me and ask me if I'm okay or if pieces like that have gone live, for example. Yeah. It's not, it's not that I'm narcissistic enough to care what people think. No. It was, just, it was just really interesting to me. So there's often an image that comes up when I'm sort of reading around and researching around ASD and kind of neurodiversity. And it's always something like, imagine that you have just come from Mars and landed on another planet and that you are, from the moment you wake up, you are trying to work out kind of the rules and the language and kind of sim simultaneously having to translate what you think to be socially acceptable, but also to phrase it in such a way that you won't cause mm -hmm. offence because you're always told you're too direct or too sensitive. Mm -hmm. it, it's yeah. pe People laugh when they say this and I always feel kind of, not ashamed, but sort of like, mm, do I say this or, some or not? When I, sometimes I'm contacted to talk on podcasts or to talk at events and that sort of thing. People laugh when they say this because I'm always like, can you just be mindful that I might need a little extra time to process what you're saying? Because of, for this reason, it's not, and the it's not me that's saying this. Um, it the word that often comes up is, oh, are you a bit slow? I've been asked that this. Is, it's just that if I had the ability to write fiction, which I don't particularly <laughs> well, I'd like I'd like to direct a short film where it's like the autistic person lands from Mars on <laughs> Earth just to show how utterly ridiculous yeah. this is. But then yeah. sort of flip it and then have like the neurotypical come to our world sort of thing. <laughs> that would be amazing. It's just yes. I just I can't particularly write fiction though. So if anyone wants the idea, you have my permission to use it. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant that's fantastic you know having ownership of what is out there is so important to the disabled community you know regardless of what disability you have i think it's so important to have ownership of, over the representation you know like that you know, even if it's just i don't know whether we'd mind able-bodied people taking the roles if behind the scenes we knew that they'd been consulted by and i mean i probably would actually i if somebody said to me would you consult on this movie and then said actually yeah we've got kate winslet to play you so there's i, I i've been listening i like podcasts and <laughs> i listened to a history podcast uh where they were talking about it's not even early hollywood cinema we're sort of talking 50s hollywood cinema so you know film's been around for the 30, 40 years, and they would cast people of Italian descent as Native Americans. What? Because they were just like, oh, well, you know, they're not white. <laughs> that is the most ridiculous thing I've heard. But, and you sort of, you look at that and 
you go, that's ludicrous. Yeah. And yet they do it with disabled characters all the time. I saw a tweet from Sia after the whole she because she sort of she sort of half-heartedly apologized didn't she like said that she'll remove bits of the film that people find distressing she and... didn't though no exactly there wasn't any warning either which she said she would put in yeah, and she never did um uh, and she actually said well i don't see the problem nobody was kicking up a fuss about uh, when our what was, what was his name the bloke in glee who was in the wheelchair the character what was the mm. name of the character she said nobody Artie? i think it was rt i've got yeah. a feeling it's RT. anyway she said nobody was kicking up a fuss about rt in the wheelchair and glee and he was in glee for like five six years and i'm like no people were kicking up a fuss. yeah you just didn't see it yeah. <laughs> because nobody was nobody outside of the disabled community cared enough to listen no the only reason she was seeing this was because it was directed at her it's just the thing about taking up space and all that sort of thing it's she wanted space that is effectively ours that's yeah. not acceptable it's 2021 i mean it's and I, I think for me as well having listened to sia's music for a long time and knowing a bit of like her story and what she's been through i think what she was trying to achieve with that film was to demonstrate that sometimes it's very hard to express yourself using words and language in the traditional sense of just talking and that there are people in the world whether they be autistic or whether they just be creative um or you know a mix and somewhere along the line between the two who find music or physical movement or something a easier way of expressing themselves and their emotions and i think that's what she was trying to say but what it's not what she ended up saying she, she ended got up saying the complete opposite what came out yeah. of her mouth was verbal diarrhea and she just couldn't stop yeah i don't really have anything to add to that to be honest you've put it more eloquently than i could ever do <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> I, it's eloquence not a word that's usually used about me it's usually loud and sweary so <laughs> i'll take that <laughs> lydia um this has been uh, this series of podcasts this week have been focusing on autism awareness because it's autism awareness week obviously now you did you write something or am i am i right in saying i knew you were going to laugh at this <laughs> um <laughs> it's <laughs> It's, I know exactly what you're going to ask me about. And I'm <laughs> laughing. It's, I'm laughing because this was a few years ago, but people are still contacting me about this one flipping piece. <laughs> and it's just, it, what, as I said earlier, this is probably going to follow me to my grave, this piece, because I still, I had a, I even had a photographer contact me about this piece. I think it was that one. Um, and she ended up photographing me for a book. <laughs> So a few years ago, I wrote a piece in connection with Autism Awareness Week slash Autism Awareness Month mm. to essentially say, I'm not a problem you need to be aware of. It's you just kind of need to work on your acceptance of me and all that is me and all that are people who are like me um, across the spectrum. Because it, the thing is, when it comes to awareness, it's there are some very there are some sometimes there are motives that do not sit particularly well with me when it comes to awareness so the thing about awareness is um i'm not a problem that you should be aware of why is it that asd is a problem to you and it sort of plays into that i've often seen this sort of thing play into kind of anti-vaxxer conspiracy sort of that whole sort of mindset really about um oh wouldn't you want to cure yourself because you're so tragic um no in in short i wouldn't want to do that and there there are people online who pedal they call them cures but it's it's called mms i forget what it stands for but it's basically bleach um oh jesus and the way that it's consumed is i was and this is by 
there was a piece in the guardian that detailed this so it's not like i'm making this up it was saying how effectively when it's consumed it breaks up your stomach lining so the stomach lining eventually has to go out somewhere and the way that that was sort of advertised to the people buying it was that was the autism leaving the child's body the thing about this awareness it often plays into that sort of thing and that's actually quite dangerous to actually have be losing your stomach line and that sort of thing um it's dangerous well in terms of anti-vaxxers it's it just i had this is going way off on a tangent but i'll say this very slowly i had a relative who is an ardent anti-vaxxer and when they found out about my diagnosis it was very much i remember one particular tirade where they were saying how you were really different after your mmr vaccine and were basically saying um that i was sort of showing my autistic self like it like like, like i suddenly like become autistic for some reason that's not true because you frankly you always are autistic if you are you don't just become it i have i have real problems with anti-vaxxers this i mean <laughs> something me and lucy are potentially going to talk about um with another guest but um it's the especially i mean so the covid vac is different from any vaccine we've ever had before the sort of delivery method but old-fashioned vaccines basically gave you a dead version of the virus mm. so what these anti-vaxxers are saying is that previously anybody who had measles mumps or rubella then would also be autistic that's that's what they're saying <laughs> sorry that's what that means uh, it's I'm, just nonsense i'm sorry i shouldn't have laughed at that but it's it's just it's so ridiculous right it's just i even had them um, this sort of rhetoric is just frankly really stupid i had them um, the DWP asked me for a sick note for a work capability assessment connected to universal credit. But this is despite the fact that they know I'm on the spectrum. It was on my application and it has been in virtually every communication since. And we're in a separate tribunal, unrelated. So my advisor said to write back saying autism is not a sickness. It is not an illness. It is a neurological condition that is lifelong and is considered a disability <laughs> rather than just, it just, yeah, it's that sort of rhetoric around like what is ASD? Well, it makes no sense to me. It just, the relative went on this whole thing about how they would cure me. And it's that, I don't know how to describe this without it coming across really sort of stupidly pathetic almost i have an issue with eye contact i'm not particularly good at it um i can't really hold it for long periods of time so i sort of have i have tactics in place so for example rather than looking in your eye i would look you between your eyebrows for example yeah you you didn't know that i wasn't making eye contact with you because it's yeah, uh, yeah. and they used to do this thing where if I was did, if I was avoiding eye contact with them, they would this is make your sure. Yeah, they would make sure that you would look them in the eye and like widen their eyes so that they would make sure and to deliberately force it, as if to say, you know, you can look at me. Yeah, it's the same sort of like people look back on the way the Victorians used to strap up kids' arms if they were left-handed and force them to use their right hand. <laughs> and it's like, that's not, you're not curing a person of an ailment. You're forcing them to behave differently to how they are naturally and how their body has been built for them to behave. You're not that... actually changing and taking away those behaviours. You're just teaching people other ways of behaving because you think the, uh, their behaviors are wrong this is an unrelated subject possibly controversial this is why i am a critic of aba therapy because it that is essentially the premise my understanding is i've never experienced it but there are a lot of people that i know or have read and there is research to that has shown that some people have developed ptsd as a result yeah we had a previous <laughs> guest on um autistic science person on twitter and they were really uh, i'd never heard of, of that treatment 
quote unquote treatment, but it sounds horrific. In some circumstances, it can be beneficial if it's, how do I put this? Um, if it's done by somebody who was properly medically qualified with consent, i.e. On, if you're a parent with an autistic child, for example, that, that seems to me okay because they're medically qualified, but I don't, I really don't have time for people who go, oh yeah, we're just going to take you to the centre and they're going to give you like these shock treatment things, which there has been a lot of those sort of rumours going around and there were, there was an yeah. expose by a paper in the States about how yeah. there was a centre doing that sort of thing. The concept of ABA therapy is more nuanced than right and wrong, I think. There are people who practice it in a quite extreme, sort of not really pleasant fashion, as we have seen. But there are cases where in the UK, it is sometimes done right. It's because it's on the NHS, for example, uh, my understanding is in some circumstances, it's also not just for ASD. But the thing is, I dislike when there are Facebook pages, for example, where they go, oh, the truth about the ABA and then the truth about the MMR vaccine sort of thing. There, there is no scientific basis often in these Facebook pages. And it's very often like conspiracy driven and all sort of about oh we we all we don't view the ASD as being a person so we're just going to build it up into a person of its own right and yeah that's oh, like, like really oh. cool you're getting your child back why why is it seen people have sometimes contacted me and said like thank you for saying this or thank you for being really quite radical why is it radical to say accept the autism as it were and sort of i don't know uh, this doesn't have a term it's after i was diagnosed i remember sitting down and just sort of thinking okay i know i have these particular challenges but what about if you sort of change your own perception of them so i have special interests i can't necessarily see social expectations in some circumstances I remember just sort of thinking, okay, if you can't see the social expectation, wouldn't that be really useful as a journalist when it comes to interviews, for example? It's really interesting to me how people go, I can't interview that famous person because they're famous and they'll never talk to me. They're a person as well. I, why wouldn't they talk to you? You just have to sort of work but you have to time it right so it fits in with yeah. their schedule and everything because you won't be friends particularly. You, It's a transaction, so to speak, but they will talk to you. What is yeah. stopping you? You could go and talk to anyone who's like really high ranking. It doesn't matter. And people have sometimes said, that's really, in that's radical. Why is that just... it? <laughs> That line of thinking was really helpful. So when it comes to special interest, for example, I have been able to kind of focus for a long period of time on projects. So I was able to trace my great grandmother's kinder transport friend. Wow. I was I was a teenager at the time, but but it it doesn't. Why is that's not a hindrance? That's an asset. No. As a, yeah. the way I see it. So rather than just sort of say, oh autism scary thing why can't you just sort of sit down and say okay so we have these challenges i want to do such and such a thing in life this is how it's an asset this is how i will use it and sort of acknowledging to yourself that there are good days and bad days meltdowns are quite horrible to experience frankly can i share something related to how the book came about yeah. yeah, but it is linked, I promise. So when they were saying earlier that I was bullied at school, um, the thing is, so it's really striking to me how people immediately see my label and there's always like it, it's just a snap second and the attitude immediately changes. Even when on the phone to Universal Credit, as soon as I said I was autistic, they started shouting down the phone because they thought yeah. I, was a, I was stupid effectively mm. um but i i'm not being funny i can fully comprehend what you're saying i just might need a bit of help sometimes um well the thing is so i was in secondary school and the way that 
my ASD had manifested itself would often end in kind of like cookery disaster. And there was one particular incident that happened. I'm not going to go into it, but I remember there were students who stood around and they were like, you're such a flid, they were saying. And they quite they kept using that quite horrible derogatory term. So that's the term for thalidomide. Right. So when all these years later, I graduated, but at the time I was working with Harold Evans, the editor of the Sunday Times, who he was the person who put in motion the Sunday Times' campaign for compensating the survivors. And they still, the survivors are still using that money and using that sort of leverage, if you like, and still campaigning for justice after all this time. I was lucky enough to go and interview him because I we'd had this misunderstanding when I was training and I was sort of like, well, who is Harry Evans? Like, you, who is this person? I've never heard of him. I went away, Googled, and I watched, um, there's a documentary on Netflix called, Attack, it's called Attacking the Devil, Harold Evans and the Last Nazi War Crime. The director of this, Jackie Morris, is one of my contacts and she, she's amazing and she's a friend of mine. We, I got to meet Harry, he was my mentor until the day he died last wow. year. He, I went to, I worked with and I've met nearly everyone involved in that documentary. In October of 2019, it was either October or November, I forget why he phoned me and we had this conversation and there was a different book on the table at the time and it was really quite surreal because this was around midnight and he phoned me and he goes, if you ever sign a contract for this book, send it to me so I can vet it for you. Which was really surreal because he used to, after he was the editor of the Sunday Times, he went off and was the editor of Penguin Random House, I think. Wow. And he, and he had, he had to, and this was really surreal because in his biography, he talks about, he was the editor for Dreams of My Father by Barack Obama, of all people. So, wow. So if he hadn't have said that, and if all that sort of thing about the cookery and me being autistic hadn't happened, I don't think I would have signed this book at all. Yeah. And there were people who from who were with me at secondary school at the same time who I've been in contact recently. And it's really interesting to me how at the time they were sort of like, oh, you're so stupid and all that sort of thing. And they were for many years after. And now they're like, you've done all this stuff and you're such a great journalist and all that sort of thing. And I'm just like, mm, bye, no, not interested. <laughs> like, it, it's just, it's just really interesting to me. So mm. this is, this is why in the book, there is a dedication to Harry. Harry was one of the most kindest souls I've ever met. And I was very, it's, I still miss him, frankly, but Aww. if he hadn't, if he hadn't have said that, I'm trying not to cry. If he hadn't have said that, this book would have never have happened and it's i hope that in if it's good enough and people seem to like it um people are contacting me and asking when it's going to be released i still don't know i've not written i've not even written it yet so <laughs> it's people have said to me they've tweeted me going it's on my christmas list for whenever it's released okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's i just hope in the long run it goes to, it goes a little way to sort of correcting this sort of weird idea that people should be caring for us all our lives and that we can't be independent and all that sort of thing. There won't be any sort of, if you Google autistic friendly cookbooks, you come up with this thing about use this particular special diet to cure the autism mm. out of your child. I I think it's really interesting what you just said about Harry Evans and what you said at the beginning of, you know, you're going to put this dedication in to um, Harry uh, in your book. And you're also putting a dedication in to the DWP. And I think they're in the acknowledgements. Those, in the acknowledgements. <laughs> I think those two things that kind of encapsulates the entire message here is, uh, you know, and, and what you're sort of saying about the difference between acceptance and awareness. Um, you know, the DWP were saying, well, you've got your mum to care for you that's somebody who 
is, uh, you know, doesn't have autism and is able to make decisions for you and look after you. <laughs> and then on the flip side, you've got Harry Evans saying, if you get a contract for this, let me vet it for you, which is him going, I know you might need a little bit of extra support with this huge mm -hmm. thing that you've accomplished. I'm going to support you, but I'm not doing it for you. All I'm doing is, you know, just standing beside you and giving you my experience and insight. And it's, they're, they're two very different things. And, you know, it is, it's kind of about the, the framing of, um, the framing of, of the provision of support and the provision of service and and need you know if you can you can consider a person's needs as being that means that they're vulnerable and they can't care for themselves and <laughs> they need someone to look after them or it can be you can consider it as a person who because of the situation they require a little extra support exactly it's i will the thing is, it's to me, it's all about a matter of perception. I'm not saying in the sense that you can overcome. I'm saying that in the sense of how you kind of view yourself. So to I sometimes think that he sort of always Harry sort of viewed me as the journalist. He didn't view me as the autistic, which some people do. I think I think the the, the, the takeaway from this conversation is the fact that well, for me, it just hammers home, really, that, you know, when you find that group of people who support you and and understand, and champion you, and they're not asking to, like, help in any other sort of way, but they're there on the sidelines going, you can do this, Lewis, you can, you know, or you can do this, you know, you, you are capable. So having somebody see past all of the, the, the label if you yeah. like they're not just seeing the autistic thing they're just or the blindness or the wheelchair they're seeing the person it is so refreshing because it's almost like a weight off because you think oh that's a battle i don't have to fight for this particular episode of what i'm doing or whatever and it's just you just hold on to those people around you you know i i always say i've not got a, a whole heap of friends but i've got a small tight-knit group of people that i know if I'm struggling with anything, I pick up the phone and they're there. Alice has become one of those people in that tight knit group of people that I whinge at and cry at. And... I'm so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> but it's but... true, isn't it? It's like, you know, it's having, finding your tribe, I think, of yeah. people that go, oh, I've got you. I and understand. I think that that was what we sort of wanted to achieve with this autism awareness series is going, we're not here trying to say, oh, you know, poor autistic people, they've got all these problems. <laughs> what we want to do is open people's eyes to the various experiences and difficulties and challenges and support needs and abilities and successes of people on the autistic spectrum and make people aware of their own perceptions and their own expectations so they can be more aware of what they can do to be supportive and welcoming rather than expecting the person with autism to have to do that educating and do that teaching and be the one who always has to say I need you to do this. Mm, it's I was talking to I'm working with a lady who owns a brand and we're trying to design a bag with each other. I was talking to her on Instagram last night and she was we sort of exchanging these sorts of experiences I've talked to you both. Um, I remember saying this was about maybe 10, 11 last night. I'm not really sure. It was late. But it seems to me kind of it's an expectation that's sort of privileged in that respect not everyone can be their own self-advocate and you can't mm. there are financial barriers there are people who put barriers in your way i.e when you're told by your doctor you can't be autistic because you're female or because you're not good at maths every autistic person is good at maths so you obviously can't be like that sort of thing it's quite a it's a privilege to be able to frankly keep on going and then basically to self-advocate for yourself 
but we have this idea that that's needed that is the ex expectation almost always that you should be able to speak up mm. for yourself and but document this and document that and cover your back the onus should be on other people it should be on the people who don't have the additional support needs if you mm. don't have the extra baggage and the extra stuff to carry around already then you've got more space in your head and more time on your hands than the disabled person or the chronically ill person or whatever because we do have extra shit to shovel and so don't make us spend even more time having to teach you when you've got all this fucking spare time on your hands. Lydia, it's been really cool having you on. I, I've really enjoyed today. And thank you for having me. Okay, so I am on Patreon. I have a blog. I have a once a week newsletter with a premium option available for disabled freelancers. I am... I regularly write for newspapers and magazines as a journalist. <laughs> I've realised as I'm saying this, this sounds really bratty and really obnoxious. <laughs> no, it doesn't I'm, matter. It's, I'm working on launching another newsletter with another journalist I know called Eloise Barry. This is going to be called the Disability Collective. And by the time this goes out, it should be launched and we're going to be putting things into it as well. So premium options, mentoring and that sort of thing. I'm making a handbag with an autism friendly brand and I'm writing a book. I think I've already said that, but okay. Yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. That's a that's eight that's options, fine. I think. So you are at journo underscore Lydia? That's me everywhere. Everywhere. Brilliant. Okay. Fuck, yes. Lydia. Thank you so much for your time today, Lydia. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody, for listening. It's been a really interesting episode, and I think I'm really pleased with what we've done this week and, you know, all the work we've put into it. We hope you've learnt a lot, because I certainly have. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to The Labelled Podcast. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe. You can follow us on social media at Labelled Podcast. Our uh, thanks go to our editor, Adam Hall, our music composer, Maisie Crunden, and our graphic designer, Sarah Coney. We'll, we'll see, see you next time. time.